Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your astrologer and your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Thank you so much for being here to celebrate with me today, Chris Brennan. Now, I have actually known Chris for quite a few years, and ever since I first met him, he has been a star in astrology. And since the time I met him, he's gone on to do such amazing things in our community. On the one hand, he did write a book called Hellenistic Astrology. And this book is truly one for the astrological canon. It is a book that will go down into reference libraries for many, many years to come. And he's also launched the uh, very wisely titled Astrology Podcast, which has also become hugely popular within the astrological community as well. So this is actually the second time I'm interviewing Chris, and he's done so much in that time. So I'm really glad to get to do it again. Thank you so much for being here, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. You, as you just mentioned, like the last interview we did was a number of years ago, and yours was actually the first interview about my book several years before it came out because there were some delays uh, so I'm glad to be back now on the other side of publishing that. And so I always like to start from the beginning. I mean, I feel like I have so many questions to ask you. You are so brilliant. But I like to start at the beginning. So tell me how you first got into astrology. Like, what was that beginning of the journey like? Sure. So I was uh, studying Nostradamus around the turn of the millennium and some of his prophecies and predictions. And uh, many of those were dated using astrology, where he would say, such and such will happen when Saturn is in uh, Virgo and Mars is in Sagittarius and Jupiter is in Cancer. And it turned out that that was a set of specific planetary alignments for a certain date. So from that, I picked up a copy of an ephemeris and started studying the movements of the planets and then discovered natal astrology. And then I was pretty much hooked from that point forward and knew that that was what I wanted to do with my life. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was 20 years ago. So that was in 1999. I guess it's uh, 2019 now. So yeah, my 20-year yeah. my 20 year, 20 year anniversary of studying astrology. Yeah, because I know that I have seen you around at astrological conferences for at least 10 years now. Yeah, I just turned uh, 35 in November, and I started studying astrology when I was about 15. That's amazing. And yeah. so tell me about the journey towards writing Hellenistic astrology. Sure. So I was studying uh, modern astrology for the first five years of my studies. And then once I got out of high school, I went to a, a college in Seattle for astrology known as Kepler College that was offering degrees in astrological studies at the time. And I was going to study psychological astrology. But when I got to the second year of the program, they uh, forced me to take this course on an introduction to ancient astrology, ancient Western astrology from 2000 years ago. And I kind of protested at first because I thought it sounded lame and they didn't even use outer planets and, you know, how much could they have known 2000 years ago? But <laughs> really quickly, I realized that my, my assumptions about ancient astrology were wrong and there was something really valuable there. So I became deeply um, engaged in the study and I went to live at a translation project for two years and then during that time, I started writing my book on ancient astrology, which took me 10 years to write before I eventually published it in 2017. And so translation, so did you come to learn another language or did you know another language or did you work off of translations? Yeah, I did uh, learn and focus on the primary other language was ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. um, we have a bunch of ancient texts that survive from the past 2000 years. They are written in other languages besides English, uh, but chiefly uh, ancient Greek, Latin, and also Arabic are the main languages that uh, traditional texts survive in. And luckily over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been a movement to translate a bunch of these texts so now for the first time in history, astrologers have access to more texts from the ancient traditions than at any other time in history. And there are still so many texts being translated. I mean, in a way, we're sort of at the beginning of a really rewarding journey, but it continues, right? We're still uncovering the past and, and also redefining it or reinterpreting it in order to fit modern times. Yeah, sometimes there's really interesting discoveries of techniques that we didn't even know we were missing that had been lost in the textual transmission. And sometimes bringing those forward in the present is causing interesting 
uh, changes in the astrological tradition, just even in the past 10 years, uh, through the discovery of even simple techniques like sect, which is the difference between day and night charts, or uh, whole sign houses, which is an approach to house division. Um, but yeah, some of the techniques do need to be updated, certainly, and figuring out how to apply them in a modern context in a humanistic way is very important. And so can you give me one example where you found yourself doing just that, like using one of these traditional techniques and applying it within a modern context? Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite techniques is uh, called annual perfections, and it's a time lord technique that tells you when certain planets will be activated in a person's chart in a given year. And that's important because uh, in ancient astrology, they wouldn't use transits. They wouldn't look at transits for timing until they had first calculated a person's time lords because the time lords tell you which planets are going to be activated in a given year of a person's life. And then they'll tell you which transits are actually going to manifest in an actual event. So <clears throat> annual perfections is one of my favorite techniques because it combines and merges very nicely and just enhances a technique that we already use in modern astrology, which is transits to make it even more effective than it already was. So how long have you been doing the astrology podcast? Cause I know most people know you from that. And I, when I first met you, you didn't have the astrology podcast. So it isn't something that's been there for a really, really long time, at least not as long as I've known you. So tell me about that journey. Like when did that begin? When did you launch? What was the first episode like and about? Sure. So I, I inherited a podcast on traditional astrology called Traditional Astrology Radio on my birthday on November 1st in 2010. I took it over from another person and I did it for a couple of years. But uh, even though I'm passionate about studying ancient astrology, I like to study many different traditions and approaches to astrology in general. So in 2012, I decided to launch the astrology podcast at theastrologypodcast.com just so I could both investigate and talk about ancient astrology, but also interview different types of astrologers coming from different backgrounds like Vedic astrology or psychological astrology or uh, you know any different type of astrology. Uh, and yeah, I just it took off after a few years, and now I'm up to episode. I just released tonight episode 234. Congratulations! Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, a lot yeah. of episodes, right? Well, yeah, and you were kind of an inspiration in terms of that because you were doing YouTube and everything else like long and interviews long, long before I was. But it was always nice to see somebody that was successful and was like doing a good job of interviewing other astrologers and creating some of those bridges between people. And uh, yeah, I was definitely interested in sort of putting my own spin on the same, same thing. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's a lot of fun to interview people, right? Like you learn a lot as an astrologer, no matter how long you've been doing it, uh, tapping into what other people know. It opens, I think it makes us better as astrologers as well when we get that chance to sit down and talk with people. Yeah, it's one of the things that's really important like especially early in a person's studies, but also later in a person's studies to continually expose yourself to different approaches and different ways of thinking about astrology, because that actually helps to make more concrete and sort of improve your own understanding in different ways. And I also think that one lifetime isn't enough to know all that there is to know about astrology. And by interacting very intentionally with other astrologers, we remember that and it's healthy in a way like it keeps us growing, but it also keeps us humble, right? In a good way. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's always somebody that knows more than you do when it comes to astrology because it is a lifelong study and it's so vast that there's no way that any one of us can completely master the entire field. So that's why it's important to interact with, with your colleagues. So there's a dog outside who wants to participate in this conversation. It is not Biggie. So people who know me from my channel, they know Biggie shows up in my video sometimes. There he is kind of hiding his head. And so that barking is not Biggie, but that's okay. We have been blessed by another voice. Perhaps that dog is an astrologer as well. Right. Yeah. It's like so, a Uranian astrologer or something. Yeah, perhaps, right? right. <laughs> Working on a, another energy field in his sure. own way. So uh, tell me more about what it is now in terms of the astrology podcast. Like, What are some interesting and recent podcasts that you've done? 
Uh, sure. So I've been focusing a lot on like historical episodes on different astrologers in order to give people an introduction to both modern figures as well as ancient figures that were important in creating astrology and turning it into what it is today. So a few months ago, I did an episode on uh, the 17th century astrologer, William Lilly, uh, with uh, an expert on that astrologer. Christian the, astrology, or yeah. astrology is what he did, yeah. Yeah, in the 17th century, he wrote the earliest major English language textbook on astrology. So it's sort of notable from that perspective, from historical from a historical perspective. But I've also done episodes on um, like Elsbeth Eberton, who was a German astrologer in the early 20th century, or uh, Michelle Gochlin, who was like a scientific astrologer in the mid to late 20th century. Uh, yeah, so I do a lot of biographical episodes, but also technical episodes as well. Okay, so let's talk about what everybody right about now is talking about, which is the astrology of 2020, all those things that we have coming up. Have you been talking about that at all on your podcast? And how has that been going? What are you hearing from your audience? And uh, how has the anticipation of 2020 been, fe been feeling to you, but also to your audience? Yeah. Uh, so last month at the end of November, my f two co-hosts of my monthly forecast episodes, Austin Kopik and Kelly Surtees, flew out to Denver. Amazing and we, people, by the way. We love them as well. Yeah. yeah. They are also great Brilliant. astrologers, but yeah. they uh, came out to Denver and we recorded uh, several podcast episodes. The first one just doing a look at the astrology of December, which is already kind of interesting because Jupiter has just moved into Capricorn, uh, where it's going to stay for the next year. Uh, but then after that, we recorded our forecast for 2020, which I just released tonight, where we sort of broke the year up into quarters in order to talk about what the major transits are. And uh, next year is really interesting because the four main things, uh, to me at least, are the year opens up with this major outer planet conjunction, which is the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, which has been sort of building up for a couple of years now ever since uh, Saturn went into Capricorn what, two years now, two, mm -hmm. two years ago now. Uh, then we've got a, a Venus retrograde and a Mars retrograde taking place in the same year, uh, sort of overlapping a little bit. And then finally, the year ends with the long-awaited Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius uh, in December of 2020. And that's huge because it's not just a 20-year conjunction, because that conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn takes place about every 20 years, but this is actually a shift into a new... Uh, triplicity, where Jupiter and Saturn are now going to take place, Th those conjunctions are going to happen in air signs for the next 200 years. So some astrologers are treating that as something that has almost a, a much longer time frame or is kind of an epoch-defining turning point. Yeah, it's so interesting you talk about that because I was just, uh, I'm preparing to do a talk just on this next month in New York City and in Florida mm -hmm. as well. And I was looking into some of the research of Kepler where he mentions this as well, where he's documenting the great conjunction leading up to this point and the great conjunction is coming up. And, and I was even just thinking that like, wow, this is not just about what's happening right now, but this is part of a much larger trend um, we really are launching into brand new directions uh, with this new decade. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that the ancient astrologers, like starting in the Middle Ages, used this technique is this was the basis of historical astrology, where you, they would mark out entire thousand-year periods of history based on these, these great mutations or these shifts of the Jupiter-Saturn conjunctions into new triplicities. So uh, this triplicity shift, we haven't seen one like that for almost a thousand years. So that gives you like some sense of how long of different frames, uh, time frames are involved and how significant this shift might be relative to world history in general. So what I find interesting to take it a little bit back, what, what we were talking about with the beginning of 2020 in January mm -hmm. of 2020, that it isn't just about, even though it's a big deal, this conjunction of Saturn and Pluto, but I actually think that it isn't just about that. It's the fact that we are having the solar eclipse and that solar eclipse is also um, sort of creating, not creating, that's not the right word. I would say reflecting this heightened awareness as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just about Saturn meeting Pluto, but the sun is there and Mercury is there and Ceres right. is there. 
there's all this very concentrated energy happening and it's under the light of Uranus direct under the light of the solar eclipse as well. Yeah, totally. And it's interesting because that series of eclipses that's been bouncing back and forth between Capricorn and Cancer has been going on for like a year and a half now. So this is, we're getting towards the end of a series of eclipses and, and this one coming up, the solar eclipse in Capricorn is one of the last ones that's taking place in that sign. So it's almost been like building up to this moment for, for almost a couple of years now and then reaches this sort of uh, crescendo in some sense in January. It's very uh, interesting to be an astrologer in these particular times with everything that is going on. So how do you see your role? Like, have you contemplated maybe uh, what your role is, what purpose uh, yours is in the context of being an astrologer in these modern times with this astrology? Yeah, I mean, part of it is just, you know, my own approach is partially reuniting, sort of reviving the ancient traditions and bringing back some of the ancient teachings, uh, but then synthesizing and uniting that with all of the good things that have been developed in modern astrology over the past century, because there's tons of great stuff that astrologers are doing, and there's no need to, you know, throw away all of that just in order to go back and study the old books. But uh, instead, there's something to be gained from each. And I think that's a large part of what my focus is and what my goal is over the course of the next uh, decade or two. Would you describe that as synthesis? Yeah, definitely. Because what, what, what I noticed is, if you go back in history, um, every time there is a Uranus-Neptune conjunction, which happens about a every 175 years, uh, there will be, the astrologers will go back and start translating texts, and there'll be a revival of older forms of astrology that are then synthesized with whatever the prevailing paradigm is for astrology at the time. And so the last year in a Neptune conjunction occurred in 1992 and 1993, and that's actually when the major translation projects were started for ancient texts that got everything going. Um, but if you go back in 175 year increments through those Uranus Neptune conjunctions, you see the same thing happening over and over again almost every two centuries. Uh, one of them actually is uh, in the mid 17th century. One of those astrologers we already mentioned, William Lilly, who wrote the very first English language text on astrology, he published that in uh, 1647. And that was within, I think, two years of one of those Uranus Neptune conjunctions. That's very powerful. So you're definitely a part of that, part of that sense of honoring the past and bringing it into the present. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's really what astrology is always about is, is having that sense of knowingness when you're doing something. And I think that's useful because you still have to do it. It's like, it's not pre-made for you. You still have to um, actualize your potential or your free will or whatever you want to call it. But it's nice to have some greater sense of meaning and purpose when you're going about doing some of these things to contextualize uh, yourself within the broader context of the, the world and at, at large or, or history in general. So finally, I'm going to throw one of these Sag Moon out of there questions at you. And I want to ask you, why do you think astrology matters? Uh, I think it matters because it runs contrary to the prevailing um, materialistic scientific paradigm, which usually holds that um, there's no meaning or purpose to the cosmos and that everything is just sort of random and chaotic and uh, pointless in, in some sense. But astrology, the fact that astrology exists and that there's a meaningful correlation between celestial movements and earthly events and that it seems to indicate things, important things that will happen in a person's life before they've actually happened, it seems to imply that there's some greater sense of meaning and purpose in the cosmos. And I think there's something very important about that because it, it points to like a property of something that's happening, uh, underlying reality that we wouldn't be aware of otherwise, and where we might draw entirely different conclusions if we weren't aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful. And I think um, the way that I like to think of it is, or the way that I articulate it is that it reminds us that uh, the stuff that the stars uh, is lit up with also lights up us. And mm -hmm. it reminds us that no matter how chaotic things may seem in our lives and in the world, 
there is some order there and there is something there that we can use to move ourselves in a positive direction. Definitely. I agree. Thank you so much, Chris. It was so much fun connecting with you again and uh, interviewing you again as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Uh, we'll have to do our next interview again sooner than the last uh, set has been. And maybe you can join me on my podcast or my channel next time. Absolutely. I would love that. Thank you Brilliant. so much. I'm truly so grateful for this moment with you, Chris. And I'm so grateful for this moment with you, my fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. More information about Chris uh, Brennan and how to find him and all that wonderful stuff to start uh, digging into the astrology podcast and all the great work there and so much more should be in the links in the description below. And thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And until we connect again, take care.